This conference will now be recorded. Thank you guys so much. So um, although I know some people typically pop in a few minutes after the allotted time, I want to make sure that we do start on time as both Kat and Sal will be speaking today are extremely busy individuals. So first of all, thank you for joining us today. I promise this will be one of the most entertaining Zoom calls you've had all day as we're making sense of a world that no longer makes sense. For example, employment rates and inflation no longer correlate. Job loss no longer sways buyer confidence. Home and art prices soar despite economic, excuse me, economic uncertainty. Given these anomalies, what can we rely on to make sound investments in 2021? Today, I have the answer. You can rely on the wisdom of Sal Gutierrez and Kat Whiting for their expert opinions on the housing market and the art market of 2021. Before I turn it over to our guest speakers today, however, I have a few housekeeping items. First, mics and cameras, please keep them off. We are recording and this is going to be spread all over the interweb, so we don't want to have any embarrassing moments. Also, questions that you may have for our speakers today. At the right hand side or the very top, you'll see a little chat function. Please click on that and put your questions in the chat function and we'll be sure to address them after each speaker presents. With that said, back to our guests that I'm very pleased to present to you all today. The first speaker, Sal Gutierrez. Sal is a senior economist and director at BMO Capital Markets with over two decades of experience as a macroeconomist. That's With BMO since 1994, his main responsibilities include analyzing and forecasting. Thank you. Thank you. And again, please, if you could turn off your mics, the Canadian U.S. housing markets and commercial real estate markets. Prior to joining BMO, Sal worked at the Bank of Canada, contributing to its quarterly economic projection. He received uh -huh. his master's degree in economics from Queen's University in 1999. Thank you so much, Sal, for joining. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, thanks, and Natalka, and, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, a pleasure to, uh, to to speak to you. Um, I would say yes. One of the the biggest surprises of this pandemic is just uh, the astonishingly uh, quick recovery of Canada's housing market. I don't think even the most optimistic realtor could have imagined how quickly and and fast uh, or strongly the housing market would have come roaring back. Uh, especially given all the job losses during this crisis. Um, it really does beg the question, you know, how immune is Canada's housing market and the Toronto housing market to uh, one of the biggest crises of, of our lifetime? Uh, to get a sense of where the housing market is going now, we do have to step back and see how, and assess how uh, the economy, where the economy is going and what the impact of the pandemic is on it. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that uh, initially. I do want to though get um, one other uh, factor out of the way and that uh, which will have an influence on Canada's economy and that is the results of the US elections. Maria, if you could advance to the first slide, please. <clears throat> so what does uh, a Joe Biden presidency mean for, uh, for Canada? Well, First off, it, it almost certainly means uh, less uncertainty about policy making um, compared to what we've been accustomed to the last four years. I think that might come as a bit of a relief to, to a lot of businesses and certainly to a lot of economists that have struggled with uh, a lot of the um, uh, fast policies uh, of, of the Trump administration. And we're probably also going to see a return to much calmer trade relations between the U.S. and its allies, in particular Canada and perhaps Europe as well. So, you know, the threat of a tariff on Canadian steel and aluminum probably much diminished now. Uh, the one bad thing that might uh, happen for Canada, or at least Alberta, is um, Biden might rescind a per the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. And, yeah, that might uh, uh, put a, a wrench in in into Alberta's uh, oil shipments to uh, the Gulf Coast refineries. But overall, I think um, uh, uh, Canada might come out ahead uh, with uh, with this Biden presidency. But really, what, what's at, the big thing that's at stake is a control of, the co of Congress. And we really don't know um, whether it will remain split until uh, early January with the runoff elections in Georgia. We're assuming that Republicans hold on to the Senate. If that's the case, we, we will 
most certainly will not see uh, the pretty sizable corporate income tax uh, rate increase that Biden is proposing. So that would be a generally good thing for the economy. But we're probably also not going to see a lot of his big spending programs as well in the areas of the environment and education and housing. Uh, and so that, that would generally imply a somewhat weaker economy. But the big thing that we're really focused on now is whether we get, get a, a fifth uh, stimulus package out of Congress, at least a plan that uh, extends some of the income support programs that are set to expire at the end of this year and which could uh, slow the U.S. economy quite significantly. We're assuming that we get uh, a package of almost $1 trillion. Remember, that's 5% of GDP, pretty significant, that at least uh, extends the income support programs to uh, the unemployed workers and for small businesses as well. So the U.S. economy uh, continues to move forward. Maria, the next slide, please. But uh, no doubt the biggest impact on the outcome uh, or the direction of the economy and the housing market will be the still unpredictable course of this pandemic. Uh, we know that parts of Europe are back in, into at least lockdown light now. Uh, France, for example, uh, the UK, Spain. Um, now we're seeing the, the payoff of those lockdowns or shutdowns because the infection rate has come off quite significantly. So that's good news. Um, but no doubt uh, the, the euro area economy will be at risk of, of, of contracting once again in this current quarter because of some of these shutdowns. Uh, the U.S. Uh, um, is also imposing more restrictions. California just recently on some non-essential business activity, and that will slow the U.S. economy. And Canada has been using kind of targeted restrictions uh, in the Toronto area, Quebec, Manitoba, and more recently, Alberta. And our economy is, is at risk of contracting, uh, at least in the current month and maybe in January. So it's going to be a, a couple of chilly months that we'll have to get, get by uh, because of this second wave of the virus and, and some of the new restrictions to, uh, to suppress it. But the real game changer here and why everyone has their hopes up is because of the tremendous progress on the vaccine front. Canada, Health Canada approved Pfizer's vaccine today. Uh, the UK was the first Western country to roll out mass immunizations earlier this week. So, you know, we're, we're heading in the right direction. That probably marks the beginning of the end of the pandemic. Uh, it's going to take a while before most of the population is, is immunized. Uh, so maybe not until the spring or the summer even when things start to return to, to normal. But at least uh, there, there's a light at the end of this COVID tunnel now. Maria, the next slide, please. And you can see that that vaccine can't come soon enough for some of the really hard hit industries um, in both Canada and the U.S. You know, it's this K-shaped recovery where some industries have actually thrived during the pandemic. Grocery stores, sporting goods stores, recreational goods stores um, have done really well. Any company that's built out the in, uh, IT infrastructure uh, has done really well. But um, then you have about 4% of our economy, um, you know, industries that uh, involve very close personal contacts, so leisure and entertainment, beauty and personal care, food services, for example, or anything travel related, uh, started to make a comeback through the, the spring and summer. But really, that, that comeback has stalled now for the last several months at levels that are well below normal, as you can see from this chart here. Uh, some industries like food services still operating 40% below normal levels of activity and uh, others such as, as leisure and entertainment, even 50% below normal level. So it's going to take a while before those, uh, those industries um, uh, return to, to normal activity, maybe another year or so. And that's only after a very effective and, and uh, full rollout of the vaccines. Maria, the next uh, slide, please. So, and that's the, the, you know one of the, the reasons our, our economy is not completely back to a normal operation right now. It's at four percent of GDP that is still struggling mightily. And remember, uh, this was one of the uh, short, steepest uh, recessions in history. Thankfully, it was also one of the shortest two-month lockdown recession. But boy, was it uh, steep! Uh, GDP contracted 18 percent in the spring. 
we've now made some pretty good headway where we've recovered um, a good chunk of those losses. We're probably operating about 4% below pre-virus levels right now. So we, we, we've regained a lot of that lost output. But our general sense, it may take almost a year until, the, until next fall before our economy fully regains those output losses. And that's even with a, a pretty effective vaccine that's rolled out to most of the population. So for, for Canada's economy, I mean, we've contracted almost 6% this year. That leaves us about in the middle of the pack of, um, of global countries. Um, uh, China may actually end, end this year uh, in, in the plus column because it was able to corral its, um, its pandemic pretty quickly. But there really are the exception. Uh, most countries will see a pretty significant contraction this year. But again, the worst uh, seems to be behind us now. We're probably looking for a couple of chilly months, you know, until uh, these new restrictions can suppress the, the virus. And then as the, the vaccine rolls out, I think we're sh it's shaping up to be a much warmer spring and a pretty hot summer. Uh, those vaccines will unleash uh, a year's worth of pent up demand for a lot of services, travel, indoor dining, for example, personal care services. And that's why we think Canada might be at the front of the pack for, uh, for leading the recovery next year with close to 6% growth, because we're also leading the pack in, in terms of the fiscal response to this crisis. And we'll talk about that. Maria, the next slide, please. You know, Canada's government has really thrown uh, the kitchen sink at this crisis. Uh, both to cushion the downturn and to support the recovery. Uh, just an unparalleled amount of fiscal stimulus on the order of 16% of GDP uh, in, as far as direct spending and other measures to support the economy. And that really shows up, as you can see on that chart on, on, your, on the left-hand side, the amount of government um, transfers to households, income transfers largely and largely to the unemployed, was on the order of four times greater in the first three quarters of this year than the loss of worker compensation. And to put that in perspective, you can see what the result in the chart on the right-hand side. You know, it's very unusual during a recession, especially a downturn that, that uh, initially you see 3 million job losses, that personal income increases 15% in the past year. That's what happened in the second quarter. Um, it it's slowed a little bit in the third quarter, but that's just a tremendous increase in income during, uh, during this crisis that has gone a long ways to supporting uh, consumer spending and the housing market. And unlike the US, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is at risk of, of a so-called fiscal cliff. If a lot of those income support uh, programs expire at the end of this year, leaving more than 10 million American unemployed um, in, in pretty rough shape and cutting their spending. Canada doesn't face that risk. Our federal government has fully extended the income support programs to the unemployed uh, and, and many to small businesses as well, well into next year. And this uh, federal economic update has basically pledged to spend whatever it takes to, uh, to, to support a strong recovery until our unemployment rate is much lower. Maria, the next slide, please. And with that uh, tremendous amount of, of uh, government income support to, uh, to the unemployed in Canada, coupled with the fact that we're just not spending the way we used to, we're not taking trips, we're not eating um, uh, um, indoors at restaurants the way we used to, so we're saving a lot more money than we normally do. That's resulted by our estimates in this mountain of savings, ex excess savings compared to, to pre-virus levels at accumulating to $150 billion or 7% of GDP. That's a tremendous amount uh, of, of support to consumer spending in the year ahead uh, to support spending. Uh, so that's why we, we are, we, we're remaining fairly optimistic on Canada leading advanced countries in its economic recovery in 2021. Maria, the next slide, please. And of course, uh, we have spent on a lot of things, goods, 
we spent le much less on, on services, but a lot of spending has, has gone into goods and many of those purchases were made online. But you know, anything related to recreation and sporting uh, goods, for example, just to while away the extra hours because we're traveling less and, and doing uh, 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 less other things. Uh, and anything related to, to housing because we're spending more time in our house. So furniture and appliances, renovations, have all benefited from this pandemic. So we've seen basically a V-shaped recovery in retail sales in Canada. Overall consumer spending is still a bit shy of pre-virus levels because of the, the hit to services, but um, overall consumer spending has come back faster than we would have anticipated. Maria, the next slide, please. Now, of course, uh, Canadian workers have taken a, a punishing blow from this pandemic, and, and that was one of the key drivers of Canada's housing market before the virus, just you know, four-decade low unemployment rates, strong job growth, especially in the high-tech sector. sector. Um, but that, that leg of the stool was cut, cut from underneath the housing market this year. Again, surprisingly, the housing market still recovered quickly. But as you can see from this chart, we almost got up to 14% uh, during the shutdowns for the unemployment rate. We've made some pretty good progress recently. We're at eight and a half percent. But remember, that's still three percentage points above where we were at the start of this year. Uh, we've recovered about four fifths of the three million job losses, but still just over half a million Canadians are, 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 have lost their jobs uh, due to this pandemic now. And in, in the Toronto region, the unemployment rate is still uh, in the double digits. So, um, you know, we still have a ways to go because the Toronto um, economy is definitely a little more skewed towards services and benefits from, from tourism and travel, for example, especially business travel and conferences. A lot of the job losses have been con concentrated amongst the very low, uh, the lower paid workers in Canada. And that that's what makes this um, unique, this recession so unique, is that upper income workers really have, have been spared during this crisis. So high tech workers, uh, business and professional workers really didn't face much loss of jobs at uh, of work at all. Uh, it really has been the restaurant, hotel, uh, travel, hospitality workers that have faced the brunt of this uh, crisis. Um, now, many uh, do tend to rent, and, and we'll see what, what the, uh, the, the negative impact on the rental market later. But overall, I think that's one reason perhaps why the, the luxury housing market, I presume, has remained pretty healthy across Canada. I don't have data to, to confirm that, but because most uh, upper income um, households have been spared the worst of this crisis, uh, I would think that the luxury housing market has, has remained pretty firm as well. Maria, the next slide, please. Besides the loss of jobs, especially in the Toronto uh, region, that should have should have hurt the housing market, uh, we saw a big drop in international migration to Canada by more than half uh, because of, of the travel bans and people just scared to to, to move. Uh, during this pandemic. And of course, that would have hit Toronto a little harder than, than the rest of the country because on average, about one in three international migrants tend to settle in the greater Toronto uh, area. Uh, so a big drop off in immigration. Now, the federal government has raised its uh, immigration targets to over 400,000 the next couple of years. So I think once we get the vaccines rolled out and the travel bans end, and people are more comfortable traveling, we will see a big rebound in, in immigration to Canada, driving our population to the strongest amongst G7 countries and driving our economy and housing household formations once again. But that may take a little while. That might be more a, a 2022 story than next year's story for, for Canada's housing market. Maria, the next slide, please. The one factor that's really helped the housing market and almost always does is affordability. Uh, one, because the, the, the monetary response to this crisis was equally impressive as the fiscal policy response. The, the Bank of Canada quickly reduced its policy rate to effectively zero. And more importantly, as we heard again this morning from the Bank of Canada, as, as basically told us or pledged to keep uh, its policy rate low 
until um, the unemployment rate is much lower so that uh, the bank has a little more confidence that it will hit its 2% inflation target on a sustainable uh, basis. And yes, we might see longer term interest rates drift a little higher over the next year as the economy recovers. But the bottom line is even long term rates, I believe, will remain quite low. The, the, the central bank is buying about four a billion dollars of, of, of assets, debt securities each week. So that's helping to keep long-term rates down as well. And basically, if inflation doesn't run away, I don't think we have to worry about higher interest rates, at least over the next year or two. We still don't expect the Bank of Canada to begin raising its policy rate for, for about three more years. Um, and we think inflation will remain fairly contained. Uh, largely because, not just because unemployment will take a while to return to normal levels, at least another couple of years, but because of automation. This pandemic has had a way of accelerating previous trends uh, towards online shopping and, and remote working, but also in businesses adopting automation, robotics, to uh, improve productivity during this crisis. And as long as, and, and the thing about automation is it helps to keep inflation down two ways, by lowering costs and by making workers very fearful about losing their jobs to a robot or an algorithm. So they're less likely to, to look for, to seek um, a, a wage increase. So if we didn't have to worry about higher inflation when we had you know, a half century low inflation before this crisis in both Canada and the US, I don't think we'll have to worry about inflation for the next couple of years. Um, and as a result, we think interest rates will remain quite low for quite some time. Maria, the next slide, please. And so those mo low mortgage rates, as you can see from this chart of, of affordability, in, in the Toronto region has really helped support uh, Toronto's housing market and, and the Canadian housing market. What you're looking at is, is basically the average mortgage payment for your typical Toronto household that's looking for your benchmark or typical property, median income family. Uh, and you can see from this chart that uh, on average, mortgage uh, payments were, were consuming about uh, one third of income typical family income through the first de a decade or so uh, of this century, um, about one third of that income. So fairly, fairly affordable, reasonably affordable. And then what happened in 2016, 20, early 2017, house prices in Toronto just accelerated. There, there was a bit of a speculative froth, driving prices higher and affordability really took a hit until um, house prices started to weaken a little bit in response to the Ontario Fair Housing Plan, some other restrictions uh, in the mortgage market, and of course the Bank of Canada began raising interest rates. So uh, affordability started to uh, to stabilize, and more and, and more so just this year because house prices did stabilize uh, early on during this pandemic. And you can see for the typical household now in, in Toronto, um, about 46% of their income would be required to service mortgage payments on a typical property. It's, I, I would not say the Toronto housing market is affordable by any stretch. It's, it's quite expensive unless you're looking at a condo, for example. But um, you know there are households that can afford properties here. Uh, you you will see though um, what it would happen if interest rates ever did go up a couple percentage points. Affordability would take quite a hit, um, and as a result, we probably would see a correction in the housing market in this region. But what's how what's what's happening? And Maria, if you could advance to the next uh, slide, is those low mortgage rates have helped stabilize affordability at least in the Toronto region albeit at, 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 at um, uh, kind of high level still. But what's really helped the, the housing market is that a lot of people, those who have the ability to work from home now and have sign off from their boss that, you know, they may not, uh, be, may not have to commute to their downtown office more than once a week, for example, have made the decision to buy larger property, less expensive property, a two hour commute or so from downtown Toronto. Um, and so a lot of young people in particular have made that decision and they're driving housing markets outside of the, the greater Toronto region even and outside of a, lar a lot of large cities, Vancouver, New York, San Francisco. So basically, 
they're, they're improving their affordability by moving away from very expensive uh, large cities. And you can see from this chart that your, your, your prime first time home buyer uh, in that age bracket, 25 to 34, the very um, uh, youngest millennials now, that, group, that age bracket is still expanding and will for several more years. So that's kind of supporting, providing that underlying support to our housing market, especially now that many have the ability, at least those who can work from home, to seek out less expensive properties. Maria, the next slide, please. So um, it's, it's, it surprised us, uh, and, and perhaps not as much as some people who were very bearish on the housing market this year and were anticipating a pretty sizable correction. Uh, we were in the camp of, of looking for about a 5% drop in house prices this year. Um, uh, but there were others that were looking for double digit declines and on a sustained basis and, and thought the housing market would not recover until next year. But you can see from that chart on the left, home sales at record highs now across Canada. And this has gone beyond uh, just pent up demand that was built up uh, during the shutdowns because house sales Home sales across Canada are up 9% year to date. So it's more than just pent up demand. And again, it's that improvement in affordability, both because of uh, record low mortgage rates and the ability of teleworkers to, 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 to move outside the, the, the more expensive regions. And you can see what's happened to prices because of this surge of demand. Um, places like Ottawa, which is our major city hotspot in Canada, um, you know, 22% price growth in the past year, uh, Toronto 11%, and that's the, the, the norm for across Canada. But even places like Edmonton, now Calgary, where prices were declining in recent years, have started to come on, uh, on the positive side of the ledger now. Um, and, and, and really, you know, you have, if you move outside the GTA to the Greater Golden Horseshoe, um, that's where you're seeing the biggest price increases. So places like Woodstock and Guelph and Brantford and Durham region, uh, those price increases are, are, are closer to 20%. Uh, and that is the influence of teleworkers. Maria, the next slide, please. So in the greater Toronto region, uh, home sales, uh, they were up 24% the past year in October. And the preliminary November numbers suggest the housing market really hasn't slowed at all. It's remaining very strong. And as I mentioned, uh, um, the more you move away from downtown Toronto, the hotter the housing market is. So it's hotter in the suburbs, North Toronto, um, Oakville, um, uh, Scarborough, for example, and then even hotter when you get beyond the greater Toronto region to the greater Golden Horseshoe region and places in the Niagara region, for example. Maria, the next slide, please. And what happens when you, 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 you stack up very hot demand um, against uh, uh, record low supply. Well, it's a recipe for accelerating prices. And you can see that from this chart uh, where we take, we take a look at the ratio of sales to new listings um, against the average home price in the Toronto re region. A pretty cl close correlation. Whenever that market tightens up as it has again, although it's not quite as tight as it was in, in 2016 and early 2017, prices tend to accelerate. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening now. And when you look at the active market, the, the total number of listings available, it's less than a two month supply at this current uh, sales pace. That's close to a record low. So again, it's a recipe for very uh, strong price growth um, in, in the Toronto region. And really it's, it's a story right across Canada in most regions of Canada. Maria, the next slide, please. There is one pocket of the Canadian housing market, though, that 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 is weak, and that is the rental market, generally in downtown Toronto. Um, in in other cities, the rental market is still relatively healthy. Uh, rents are still rising very slowly, uh, but not in, in in the Toronto market. And, and the story here is that across the Greater Toronto Region, uh, resale condo rents are down 12% now in the past year to October, uh, inventory has just soared. Um, one reason is because uh, uh, of a lot of supply from the Airbnb short-term market uh, because of the loss of tourism. 
but as well on the demand side, you know, just uh, those job losses were concentrated amongst lower paid workers who tend to rent, less immigration, um, students uh, spending more time living at home and studying rather than renting. And of course, this shift away from the, the urban uh, downtown markets, rental markets, uh, because more people can afford a less expensive property beyond the urban core now. So that's all uh, conspired against the rental market in downtown Toronto and to some extent against the condo market itself. Um, so that's where we, we are seeing condo prices started to weaken a little bit in both the resale and the new condo market. Um, and, and more of that weakness is in the downtown Toronto market. As you move away uh, from downtown Toronto, uh, you're still seeing some price increases in the 905 condo market, for example, uh, where the market is a little healthier. Our general sense is going forward, yes, the condo market, downtown Toronto and rental market will remain a bit soft until we get well into this recovery through next year. Um, we see a lot more jobs coming back and immigration starting to come back. I think that will put a floor on this weakness in condo prices in downtown Toronto. Maria, the, the next slide, please. So just to recap, uh, before we, we take some questions, uh, this two-month lockdown recession is over, thankfully. It's going to be a bit touch and go the next month or two. We could see GDP contract in December this month, maybe even January because of these new restrictions. But that, that would probably not be uh, declared a recession as long as we pull out of it pretty quickly. Um, now, the recession has not ended for some of the, those hard-hit industries restaurants for example hotels they will take longer to come 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 back but you know hope is on the horizon now because of uh, of the vaccines that are being rolled out the housing market has, has astonishingly just thrived during this pandemic um, and and prices have just come roaring back uh, we think house prices across canada and in the toronto region will remain pretty firm over the next year, we do not anticipate a correction, um, but we do expect sales to moderate and the growth rate of prices to slow quite significantly. We're, we're kind of on an unsustainable course now that if prices continue to rise at a double digit rate, affordability will, would become an issue again. Uh, housing is still very affordable across most of this country. Um, but uh, not if prices continue to rise at, at, at a greater greater than 10% clip. So, you know, given some lingering economic uncertainty and high unemployment, we do expect to see price growth uh, uh, moderate quite significantly. But overall for Canada, we still expect house prices to increase 6% through next year, a little less in Toronto. Uh, and as you move, move out from the downtown core, that's where you'll see most of the strength in the housing market linger, at least into, into the first half of next, next year. Uh, so the suburbs, for example, will outperform um, the downtown core for a while longer until all that pent up demand from teleworkers is fully uh, unleashed and exhausted. So I'll leave it at that, but welcome any questions. Thank you, Sal, so much for that. Every question that I had, you addressed in your next slide. So extremely thorough and, and quite optimistic, which is incredible. What I found quite impressive about Canada generally during this pandemic um, is how we reacted to it both um, from an economic perspective and a social perspective, which is what is putting Canada on the map. And that perhaps um, you know, makes us still a very attractive place for, for immigrants, which is the backbone of a lot of our real estate, um, uh, or the, the booming real estate, so to speak. Uh, I do have two quick questions for you. The first one is any surprises that you expect in 2021? Given what we've seen already in 2020, anything can happen, but I'd love to get a bit of your perspective on that. Yeah, the one big surprise, uh, positive surprise that we might see play out again in 2021 is just the housing market failing to cool down and just remaining red hot. Um, you know, if we get if, if that rollout of the vaccines, is, it goes better than we anticipated and is quicker than we anticipate. We'll see those jobs come back and immigration come back faster and the economy will just surprise to the upside and support the housing market. And, you know, it may be the case uh, much like in the past where the housing market just does not slow until we see the government impose some new restrictions 
in the mortgage market or, or, or the housing market to cool things down a little bit. So I think that could be the one uh, one big, big positive surprise playing out again next year. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and perhaps those taxes that are being contemplated now might have a little bit of that effect, but it's spotty. Uh, now, one more question, Sal, and we'll let you get to your to your evening. And that is, uh, again, of course, put all disclaimers that you need around this. What is your half-baked, somewhat crazy prediction about how the world will change forever because of COVID-19? Well, I think we've already seen uh, how the world will change Um uh, going forward and, and you know even post vaccine and that is we're just doing a lot more stuff online digitally learning buying working basically everything uh, we're doing a lot more stuff online and I think that's a trend that will just uh, that's accelerated and will continue not at an, ac an accelerating f fashion but will continue going forward so that the overall e-commerce share of, of what we buy will remain elevated. Um, you know, the work from home trend, I think uh, we, we, we will see at least a partial permanent shift towards working from home. Many surveys suggest that workers just like that hybrid uh, model, that flexibility and work-life balance that they can achieve by working from home. And certainly they, they like the cost savings of not commuting as often. And for companies that have already spent to roll out the IT infrastructure to support teleworking, I don't think they'll go back as well because they they can they can save a lot as well in terms of office leasing. So we will go back to the office, but not the way we we we, we used to. So the the work from home trend will will continue in some fashion, and that ha does have implications for not just the commercial real estate market but the housing market going forward, as we talked about. Certainly, and in fact, I wonder if that work from home that stays permanent, a permanent fixture in how we live our lives, will prevent the boom and bust that we saw in the suburbs with the baby boomers in the 90s. So it'll be quite interesting to watch how that permanently changes our housing market. Sal, thank you so much again uh, for your time and for your wisdom. Uh, I certainly hope that uh, the hot summer comes a lot faster and is a lot hotter in 2021. And we look forward to hopefully having you come back and uh, talk to us a little bit more about what you see in the future. Thank you again, Sal, for making sense of all the complicated clutter that we're seeing in the headlines. Thank you, Natalka. Take care, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. So a wise mentor of mine who's had great personal and financial success told me that he had only two regrets in his life. The first one is not buying enough real estate, and the second is not buying enough art. The latter, however, is much more difficult to get right, and it's for the reason, and it's for this reason, excuse me, that I'm very excited to turn their mic over to our next speaker from Chrissy's Auction House, Kat Whiting. Now, Kat has a phenomenal history and, um, and experience in this realm. She's the specialist and head of the afternoon sale and post-war and contemporary art in the department of Christie's Auction House in New York. Ms. Whiting has joined Christie's in 2014 and is responsible for sourcing and selling the department's afternoon sale of contemporary totaling 70 million per year. Kat appraises unique works of art from 1945 to the present day for private clients, museums, and corporations. And prior to joining Christie's, uh, Kat was at uh, the, excuse me, the Pace Gallery, and part of that was a curational assistant for the public art on the High Line in New York. Uh, I love the High Line, by the way, Kat. Phenomenal job there. Kat earned an MA degree in the history of art and the art market with a focus in modern and contemporary art from Christie's Education and a BA from Colgate University with a major in art history. She received also high honors in art history for a thesis on the work of Robert Colescott. What an introduction. And I'm very excited again, Kat, for you to talk to us about how to value uh, work, or, excuse me, artwork in this time period right now. So I'll throw it over to you. I'll zip it up. And thank you so much, Kat, for presenting and coming with us today. Thank you, Natalka. And thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I would love to talk to you today about how to value a work of art because, as Natalka mentioned, it is a difficult one to put your finger on. Works of art are unique. They're also subjective. So while I might love a piece of art, someone else might hate it. While someone might hate green and never want to buy a piece of art with green in it, another person might love animals and only buy animal-themed art. So 
this subjectivity is what makes valuing a piece of art difficult. Um, and that's something that I want to give to you today is the tools with which you can use when looking at art yourself. Um, and to think about just if you're interested in the generic kind of economics of the art market, which are really fascinating, you'll be able to kind of understand how the auction market works, how galleries work, um, et cetera. So uh, introduction. I also would remiss, be remiss if I didn't mention that while I'm American, uh, my family does have a cabin up in Georgian Bay, just north of Toronto. So I do miss Canada very much. We missed it this summer, of course, because of the pandemic and looking forward to it hopefully in 2021. So another good thing to look forward to in 2021. So on the slide, as you can see, this is the Christie's auction room typically. While this year we weren't able to have people in the sale room, I wanted to give you just a snapshot of what it looks like typically um, as this was taken last year. We can go to the next slide. So on the next slide, what you'll be able to see is just some fun snapshots of Christie's throughout the years. Um, the one on the left is from 1808. This is from Ackerman's Microcosms of London. And you can see that, you know, the look of Christie's auction room hasn't changed that much over its 250 year history, which is kind of amazing. So it's, it is a snapshot um, of history to come to a Christie's auction room. And I should mention, in normal times, anyone can come to the Christie's auction room. You can um, walk into a Christie's auction house, be it in New York or London or Hong Kong, um, and be able to sit in the auction room. So I do encourage it once, once the vaccines are prevalent and we have that again. You'll see then in 1987, this is when we sold Van Gogh's sunflowers um, for then a record amount. And you can see it didn't change that much over that long 150 odd year history. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to show you what it looks like today. So you'll see the image on the left was similar to what we just saw, but the image on the right is now what our auction room looks like during the pandemic, which is completely different because the room is not full. And what has been spectacular in a way, the silver lining I'd say about the pandemic is that it's forced Christie's to innovate. Um, I know that we talked about this a little bit in relation to real estate in terms of the fact that we have to go more digital, more online, and that has been the same for the auctions. You'll see that all the specialists are spaced out. There are screens that are actually um, showing images of bidders in Hong Kong, London, um, elsewhere around the globe. So in a way, that's been one of the silver linings that I've seen at least in the auction world and the art world is that we've been forced to move digitally and our clients thus have been forced to buy online, um, often sight unseen, which is kind of, it's saying something when you are talking about art because what a lot of clients and why a lot of clients buy art is because they love that passion of being able to be moved by art in person. And without that emotional response, it becomes difficult to dive in and bid these high numbers for these artworks. So it's certainly been a hurdle, but it's been something that I think has been revolutionary for the art world. Um, and it's been a big learning experience for myself in my career, but also the rest of my colleagues. So it's been a, a fascinating experience to um, have to be up against this adversity of this moment, which has been extremely challenging, but at the same time has created opportunities for us. Right. You'll see the real difference in live versus online bidding. Live means, you know, in the room or on the telephone. And then online, you can see the difference between October, which are the, the orange bars, um, 2020 versus July 2020, which are the, the blue bars. And then 2019 November is the green. And you'll see just the difference in registered clients online, the lots that were sold to online bidders, and also the total accepted internet bids have really skyrocketed in these sales. And another interesting fact is that over 50% of the works that were purchased in our most recent auction just last week uh, were not seen by the ultimate buyers. So we're talking about millions of dollars that are spent sight unseen. And that certainly is something that is revolutionary in the art market during the pandemic. If we go to the next slide. So 
that was kind of my talk about what we've seen during the pandemic at Christie's. What I want to talk about now is really zooming out a little more about the art market in general and how we even place value on a work of art. Because this is something that not only in the pandemic, but throughout one's interest in art, you can use this concept when looking at a piece to understand what financial value it has. Um, this is something that is difficult. As I mentioned, it is subjective, but I'm going to give you a few different parameters or factors that impact the value of a work of art in order to better understand how to break it down. Because I'm sure we've all had the experience when you walk through a museum and you hear, you know, that work of art is priceless. It's actually not. Everything has a price. And even I, as, as Natalka mentioned, I do value works for museums often. So even the Mona Lisa has a price on it. Um, you know, we sold the Da Vinci a few years ago, which was spectacular, and it sold for $450 million. So everything has a price. And that is what's interesting. Once you learn that, you're able to then question, so what goes into that number? Obviously, you had to convince someone to pay that. And at its most basic, a value of a work of art is what a willing buyer and a willing seller will trade for that work of art as a monetary value at a specific period of time where each one is not pressured to buy or sell. So that's what we generically term fair market value for a work of art. But there are a lot of factors that go into that fair market value. And first and foremost, similar to real estate, we use comparables. <clears throat> comparables are similar to real estate, looking at comparable works of art in this case, throughout maybe the past few years, that relate to this work that you're looking at. And what's helpful about that is you're able to then look at works of art that are similar in size, similar in uh, period perhaps, similar in style to the piece that you're looking at. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in that sense, those can be very helpful. What you can also look at in terms of those comparables is um, let's say if the work of art was in good condition or not. So that's another factor that can impact the value of work of art. Uh, the provenance or the ownership history of that piece. All of those factors go into the ultimate value that you place on the work. Now at auction, what I'm going to do is give you a, a kind of example here that we can talk through these values a little bit more. So that example is the Ed Ruscha piece that you see on your screen right now. This was an amazing piece in person. Ed Ruscha is an artist um, based in California. He was part of a movement that was called West Coast Pop. So while Andy Warhol on the East Coast was creating his Marilyn Monroe um, soup can paintings, uh, Ed Ruscha was creating this unique brand of pop art on the West Coast. And he was best known for this use of uh, using words in art um, and taking those words from advertisements and other sources abstracting them, putting them on the canvas without any sort of relation um, to what the word says, but still giving you that feeling of the word. So in this case, he puts the word radio on the canvas, which gives you an auditory sense as well as reading the word as well. Um, this piece is extremely rare. So I'll go through each of the factors that I'm giving you on the left in relation to this piece to kind of explain explain um, why I, I point out each of these. So the provenance was extremely rare. It was coming from the collection of Joan and Jack Quinn, um, who were extremely prominent West Coast collectors. And they had had this for the entirety of the work's lifetime. They bought it out of the artist studio in the 60s. You can see this from 64. I think they got it in 65. So that made it extremely fresh to the market. The rarity of the piece, these never come to auction. I mean, maybe once every five or six years. So that caused the interest in the piece to be very high. The quality of the work, it was a extremely perfect example of the series. A lot of these are in museums, so it was rare to see one of these come up at auction. The condition was perfect. That's also very rare. Often you see these being cracked all over the surface. So that was of interest as well. And then market taste is kind of the last factor that I wanted to talk about, which is um, a little bit of the X factor because it's about what's hot right now. And Ruscha certainly was at this time experiencing later in his career, um, an uptick in interest in terms of value of his work. Because while Warhol had quite an early interest in value of his work, 
Roche came a little bit later in the market. So, you know, the top price for Warhol occurred in 2010, um, whereas the top price for Roche happened with radio just in 2019, so almost a decade later. So you can see on the slide here a pretty miraculous price for radio. It was estimated at 30 to $40 million for this one painting and sold for $52 million. So this even, I have to say, staggered a lot of um, the staff at Christie's because at this point, before this sale, the top price ever that had sold for an Ed Roche painting was $30 million. So this completely shattered the record and really uh, reevaluated where to, where to price Ed Roche works from here on out. If we go to the next slide. So I wanted to bring up some other works by Roche because I also wanted to underscore that we don't only sell $50 million paintings at Christie's, we also sell works that are $5,000, $1,000, $100,000, um, and this just gives you kind of a cross section of the fact that even a single artist can have a huge diversification in terms of the value of their work. And you can see these are three examples, all from the same private collection, actually, of the Clark collection, um, where you know a gunpowder on paperwork, palm in the upper right, uh, did extremely well, sold above its estimate. Another work you can see a little bit lower in the center, um, it undersold, so it sold under the estimate. And then the work on the right sold over the estimate again. And a lot of the reasons for this and the reason why that one in the center didn't do as well, as you can kind of see from the screen even, the letters are extremely small, it's kind of hard to read, the color is a bit bland compared to the green of palm. Um, thin, as you can see on the right hand side, is a print. So um, prints differ in terms of their market than unique works of art because you're able to value them a little bit easier against the rest of the edition. So this was in perfect condition and for that reason did very well against the estimate, but if it wasn't, it wouldn't have. So, you know, this just gives you a little bit of a, an example of how the art market is extremely specific for each piece and each medium of which an artist produces in. And that's why it can be very complicated. If we can go to the next slide. So another case study they wanted to bring up um, just in terms of a, a market case case study is this um, Matthew Wong painting, which um, is spectacular in the sense that if you look at its pre-sale estimate against what it sold for, it obviously sold for a lot more than its pre-sale estimate. So the estimate was 500 to 700,000, and it sold for $4.4 .4 million. Now you might say, did you guys just get it wrong? Are you bad at your jobs of knowing what these things are going to price at? And look, I think it's I've been asked that question before, and it's a funny question to be asked because it does look that way. But in a sense, our estimates are not always what we think the work is going to go for. Actually, what they are really is a marketing tool. So our estimates are a range of values, as we've seen throughout this presentation, where we say, you know, this is what you can get the painting for, because the minimum that we'd be able to sell this for is the low estimate. And if a client sees it and thinks this is worth millions of dollars and sees that low estimate, they're going to be hooked. And that's what we use in order to get attention to the auction and attention to the works of art. This is an, uh, definitely a, a unique situation that this went much higher than we thought. We certainly thought at this time, we thought maybe it would make a million dollars. We did not know it was going to make four. But all you need is two to tango. And if two people really want these pieces and fight for it, they will keep pushing each other higher in the auction room and then set that value. And the reason we think this value happened is that, very sadly, Matthew Wong, in his early 30s, passed away just a year ago. So there was a limited supply of his work. And this is one of the best ones that had ever come up. This had been purchased just a few years prior for $10,000. So obviously that person made a very good return on investment. Um, obviously no one would have known that he would have passed away, but um, this is one of those examples where like the stock market, you know, you're, you're kind of bidding on that stock that you hope but don't know will skyrocket um, instead of the kind of steady stock, let's call that the Andy Warhols of the world, that will keep a pretty consistent market. Um, so this is one example of market taste that now has been really taking the auction world by storm. And after this price, every single auction house had a Matthew Wong coming up this season. And across the board, they all broke a million dollars. Um, I would say four or five were up just this past month alone. 
We can go to the next slide. So I also want to talk a little bit about context and marketing and how that impacts value. Because we've talked a little bit about how the artwork itself has value, but not as much about how the auction house can impart value on a work of art. And I think that's something that's really interesting because as we all know, how you market a piece can give it value. And I want to specifically note in this um, presentation on a, a fun work that we had, an atypical work that we had up for auction this past October, which was a uh, real fossil of a Tyrannosaurus Rex named Stan. Um, and what we did here is we actually put the Tyrannosaurus Rex, which we don't really have a, a fossil sale, so we decided to put it in our masterpiece sale of post-war and contemporary art. Um, obviously an odd context for a dinosaur, but in a way, giving it that context of a masterpiece of its category in and of itself, put it in a context where it was given value um, instead of putting it in, let's say, a house auction, which is typically for home goods and things like that. You know, we were giving it the label of you should look at this if you buy masterpieces. And that alone can give a piece the interest from collectors. Um, we also had a full-blown marketing campaign around it. We created videos. We had banners outside of Rockefeller Center. Um, you know, we had a full catalog for the piece. So the presentation of a work as well, how many pages it gets in the catalog, if you write an essay, all of these things impact how clients then consume the work and therefore want to own it. Um, and so I find it really fascinating. In this case, obviously, it worked very well against the estimated six to eight million. It made over $30 million. And that was a record for a T-Rex and a record for a fossil. So pretty spectacular um, with a, a very large bidding war. As you can see our auctioneer Tash Perrin on the left, who is Canadian, um, is, was the one who took the auction for the T-Rex. So um, it was fun to work with. If we go to the next slide. So the last thing I wanted to touch on was our private sales. In addition to auction, we also have a private sales department that, similar to a gallery, transacts with works kind of behind closed doors. So instead of auction, which is public, um, the private sales market is chosen by certain collectors because instead of setting a lower auction estimate, where you have that risk of selling at the low number, a private sale, you can set a higher number, and we would then offer to a few unique clients, usually private clients, who've shown interest in those works before to us. So it's a way to be a little bit more discreet with our offerings. And we've seen a huge uptick in private sales during COVID. I'd say there's a few reasons for that. The first half of the year, we weren't able to have any auctions because we weren't able to have people come to Christie's to see works in person or to even personally as personnel and employees of Christie's be in the building. So without that ability, we really put all of our efforts into private sales and saw a huge impact there. And our private sales have been up threefold since last year, which is pretty spectacular. Um, we also were given the opportunity to do special projects that we, not, we wouldn't normally be able to during normal times. And one of those examples um, I have on this slide is Dream Big, which was a private selling exhibition of large scale outdoor sculpture, which we kept all of the sculptures in situ in their locations and sold them online. So where we never would be able to have an exhibition of outdoor sculpture at Christie's, we were able to have it digitally. And the private selling exhibition did extremely well. The other project that I wanted to highlight, which is a great project, um, was Say It Loud, which was an exhibition um, mainly in response to Black Lives Matter movement, which was curated by Destiny Ross Sutton, who's a fabulous curator. And she chose a group of artists that she had followed and she was friends with um, black artists from around the globe who were painting in a figurative style and discussing representations of blackness. And all of the proceeds there went directly to the artists. So Christie's didn't take any cut. We basically just gave our platform for this initiative. And I thought this was a really great way to give back to the community, to also educate our community, and to give the opportunity for these artists to have a world stage for their work. So you can see um, some of the works that sold and their prices they were really reasonable um, and really fabulous work. So it gave us an opportunity to kind of give back in that way as well. Um, and with that, I think the next slide is my question slide. So let's see, did I hit it right? Yes. Um, so happy to take any questions that you have.
Certainly so, Kat. Um, regarding auctions, I do have a question from Todd Skinner, one of our agents. How are customers getting comfort buying art sight unseen during the pandemic? Is Chris's mm. doing special or different to give buyers comfort or people just getting comfortable with it? Todd, a great question. And I do have to say that one of the um, most interesting components there and what really resonated for, I'm sure, our realtors, myself as well, is how similar it is to, um, you know, the pricing of a home and how many buyers mm -hmm. you have, the quality, the in the providence, the uniqueness, the property, so on and so forth, and how you place it and how you market it. So great question, Todd. And Kat, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is a good question. And the answer is it's a little bit of both. I think, first and foremost, a lot of buyers maybe already have contacts like myself at the auction house that they trust to give them honest feedback of a work of art. And they, if I know someone's collection, I can say, yes, it will fit into your collection. Here's the condition. And they'll trust us. That doesn't always happen because we have a lot of new buyers to Christie's and they might have a proxy come in. That's one point of, you know, a conservator they trust, a friend they trust to come see the things. But if they can't see them at all, that's where Christie's has actually come up with a lot of innovations in order to accommodate this. So we actually have created with a program called Exhibit a, a whole virtual layout of Christie's and we've placed virtually all of the works in the exhibition. So you can digitally walk through a Christie's exhibition whenever it comes up. So that's something that we've innovated. Um, so it's almost like you're in a video game, walking through Christie's, looking at all the artworks. Um, we've also created digital catalogs. We actually used to print big catalog books to send to clients and now it's fully digital. So we've been able to now embed videos. We've created super zoom technology, which magnifies up to 800 times a work of art when you see it. So you're able to really like look as if you were in person two inches away from the surface and see all of the brush strokes or condition issue that you'd like to see. So these, I mean, Christie's invested all in new cameras, all in new video aspects. And I think in a way, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, that in a bit was the silver lining because we needed to do that. But this pushed us to have to do that. Wonderful. And, and Kat, we're getting so many questions here and really good ones. My question was, who's buying a T-Rex and where are they putting it? <laughs> front um, lawn, but, just in your front <laughs> lawn. Wonderful. Um, so a couple of questions we have. Um, what can artists working in the primary market learn from your response to COVID in marketing their mm -hmm. own works? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, Honestly, it's very hard for artists right now because a lot of them can't even get into their studios. I mean, that's a huge, it's a huge issue. But I think, you know, in terms of marketing during COVID, honestly, my biggest reference is Instagram. And I think there's, in a way, what's nice about technology now is artists have the means in order to market themselves on platforms like Instagram and, and Facebook and otherwise in order to show their art. And I know a lot of people who have been discovered through Instagram and other platforms like that. And in a way, that's a nice way to keep active when you might not physically be able to, um, or your show has been postponed, or your gallery hasn't been able to show your work. Um, you know, that's been a way I've seen artists really kind of take their own reins of the situation and push ahead. But it, it is difficult. Thank you. Uh, next question we have about the Canadian art market. It comes from Sharon, one of our agents as well. She's asking, do you have an auction or a private sale arrangement for works of Canadian artists? Given that it's you do, we usually, <laughs> I know, right? We do, we do have a Toronto office and we do um, fold those works actually just into the different categories. So we don't have a Canadian sale per se, but depending on from the period from which they worked, we do have, you know, a contemporary sale like we you know we sell Agnes Martins all the time things like that so um, it really it's more about period in which they work rather than nationality wonderful thank you um, I have a three more questions but two I am sure I can merge into one and one quick mm -hmm. one is there an equivalent to fin track in the art world so um, money laundering essentially mm -hmm. what that question has to do with um, I know that certainly that's the case mm -hmm. when it comes to jewelry um, jewelers do have to document um, where the funds are coming from etc is there something similar to that in the art realm 
Yes, and it's very serious at Christie's, as you can imagine. Um, you know, we have to do due diligence on both sides of the transaction. We represent the seller, so that's obviously the majority of where that happens. And that links a bit to provenance as well, like where is the work coming from? Who is the owner of the work? Making sure we have all that ownership documentation in place, making sure we pay out to that person and not someone else. Um, and then also from the buying side, we have to make sure they have the funds and that that person is able to bid and able to provide those funds. So we do work on both sides. And since we're actually a UK based company, we're actually, you know, those restrictions are even stronger than in the United States in many ways. So we are beholden to those. Oh, fascinating. And actually that, that leads into my perfect next question. So as some of you may know, I have read a book on art fraud, not because I want to commit art fraud at all. I have no skill or talent in that space. However, I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating because art fraud does happen, um, especially mm. with, with online um, sales right now. I'm sure it could happen on both ends, you know, an unqualified buyer, which does happen in the real estate market quite often. And, and mm -hmm. as Carly said, is also a piece of work that is a lemon. Um, you know, any mm -hmm. any way that that um, our audience can can get some guarantees or, or some comfort around that? How can you detect a fraud? Um, you know, and, and what's the process of getting a, a, an artwork piece appraised at Christie's? Sure. Well, to answer the first part of your question, look, it takes years and years and years of experience, and I think a lot of it is is through seeing and through uh, researching these artists because, you know, in my position, I now know if I see a Warhol that doesn't have a stamp from the foundation or the signature looks slightly different than the hundreds of other ones I've seen or the format is slightly the wrong size. Those are things that can kind of tick me off. But I think that gut feeling, honestly, most specialists will say is the first thing that you notice when you look at a fake. And it happens all the time at Christie's, but I think that's why you buy from Christie's and Sotheby's and the big houses, because we have those experts, we've done that due diligence, and the, the artist that sold at Christie's is guaranteed as that artist by us for at least five years, that's the statute of limitations, um, or longer depending. So, you know, we have put our money behind um, and our expertise behind knowing that that is right but we do turn away works all the time. And in partnership with us, I'd say in the contemporary field, this is the most prevalent. Um, we often talk to the artists themselves. That's the best case of being able to say, did you make this or not, if they're still alive? Second would be their family members or their studio or their estate, we go to them as well. So in addition to our own expertise, we do a whole laundry list of checks externally as well to make sure the work that we're selling is correct that the provenance is correct, that we have all the exhibitions correctly. So um, all of that is part of the process. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that takes a lot of time, but if you go to the right places, you are pretty much assured that it is the real thing. It's when you, know, you find something on eBay that you think is right, that you should be a little concerned unless you have a friend who's an expert who can help look at it for you, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kat, for all of that. And I want to be respectful of your time as we are a little bit running a little bit over. You know, it's incredible to me to see the parallels between the real estate industry in COVID-19 and the art industry. Both boomed, which is quite clear with respect to some of the, the mm -hmm. big wins that you had in, the, in the, your latest auction. And in addition to that, more than ever, more than ever, you need to have an expert on your side because you could very well be buying a lemon or buying something way over value or something that just is not what it seems to be. And so with having said all of that, I wanna say again, a big thank you to everybody that has joined us today. I wanna to say a big thank you to our team at Chestnut Park, Tanya, Karen, Maria for helping organize this, as well as Kat and Seth from Christie's for all of your support and for agreeing to come and present and spend an evening with us, as well as BMO Capital Markets. We certainly enjoyed this. Do look out for this all over the interwebs. Um, we will have this recording available for everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, stay well, and I'm very excited to see what happens in 2021. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.